Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here and seeing um, so many familiar faces. Uh, my name is Hannah Kazkas. I'm a rheumatology consultant at University College Hospital. Um, I worked and trained by Professor Graham. Everyone knows Professor Graham, who's the, our father, the father of hypermobility. And I've taken over the management of the hypermobility um, clinic um, at UCH, which is regarded as a national center. And that was in, 1990, uh, sorry, in 2008. Um, I'm very excited to be here today, not only to present to you the, um, the EDS new uh, classification, but also because, as Kay has mentioned, this is the first event that the two charities that are very close to us as doctors have come together to, to do an event like this. Um, Alan, uh, that, um, as Kay has mentioned, was meant to give this talk with me, but unfortunately he hasn't been able to come. So if you see his picture at the top of the slide, you will know that it is his slide. So if you like that, um, by all means, remember that I presented it. If you don't like it, it's his fault. <laughs> so um, the, I'm going just to say the outline of my presentation. So I thought, because we're talking about a new classification, I think it's very important to know the history. So I'll give you some historical aspects of EDS then talk about the hypermobility. I will talk about the problems that we are facing because of the issues in the history and the challenges. And then talk a little bit about the EDS classification. I'm not going to talk in details, but the way I feel, I'm going to give you the inside story because all the information is out there. There are papers that have been published. It's on the website. I'll just sort of point towards the few changes that are very important for us to understand and then really um, talk about the next uh, step. So the history of EDS. I always try to explain to my patient in the clinic is when we talk about EDS is where did the name come from? So Alice and Danlos are two skin doctors. So the problem was a skin problem. A hundred, around 115 years ago described to um, uh, presented cases when the problem was a very, um, uh, like a, a problem with the skin, which is a stretchy skin, fragile skin, and flexibility of the joints. So that was 115 years ago. But over the last 100 years, the same name was borrowed to be given to other conditions when we've had issues with the joint problems and also a skin. So the first um, documentation, if you want to say, or a sort of a clinical research in terms of, cataract, um, in terms of trying to diagnose these conditions was in 1986. At that time, um, a group of uh, mainly geneticists around the world gathered in Berlin and they looked at all the conditions that related to connective tissue. So we're talking about not just EDS, it's all the conditions with connective tissue. Say so they were describing 12 different conditions, including osteogenesis imperfecta, Marfan syndrome, Stickler syndrome, EDS, and other things. It was a very big task, as you can imagine. And at that time, the EDS in particular, or hypermobility, was more descriptive. So they were saying, there wasn't a real criteria. They were saying, okay, we've got these conditions, and maybe this is what? This is the information that we know about. And they use the numbers. So they use EDS1, EDS2, EDS3. So when you hear EDS3 being used, you know this is 1986 criteria because that has been revised since then. So they did an amazing job. It was a big, big task. And no wonder that the EDS didn't sort of um, have um, enough focus in their, uh, in their paper because they were talking about other things. Ten years later, that, um, um, that uh, diagnostic criteria was revised because a lot of information in the 90s, the beginning of the 90s, and particularly 1993, we had more information about genetics or possible genetic links, which did not go to the previous criteria. And also, there was quite a lot of confusion about these numbers. So, for example, a classic, or what we call now the classic EDS, is a... Um, it's a collagen 5 problem, but it's called EDS1 or EDS2. The vascular type, which used to be called type 4, is actually collagen 3 abnormality. So the collagen names and the, the, the 
condition names got mixed up, that there was also a need to try and describe it according to the clinical picture rather than numbers. And that's where the 1997 criteria arrived. Um, and again, it was internationally uh, recognized. Uh, the people put quite a lot of effort in terms of diagnosing it according to what's the clinical features, and they put information about genetics. And if you actually look at the papers at that time, you will find something like, this is provisional, we need more information, that um, the genetics so far is suggestive of this, but the technology is not enough, and we need to look into that about the future. And guess what? Nothing happened for 20 years. So when people talk to us and say, why is being revised? We're all confused now. It was about time. And hopefully I will give you the inside story about how did that happen. So very briefly, I think this is a pointer, I think. Laser pointer, yeah. So if we look at, oh, okay, nope. I wanted to do a pointer, but that's all right. If you look at the nosology, um, which is the 1986, you will see the different types when we talk about one, two, three, five. So this is where the, um, I'm, because I get asked that all the time about type three. Have people been confused about the names? Lots of people, do, thank you very much. So if we look at the hypermobility, for example, it's type three, but that's in the older one, 1986 criteria. So 1980, uh, 1997 criteria, we talk about hypermobility. So these terminology, although they're old, but you will still see them in clinical letters, you will see them in lectures, you will see the confusion about them. So according to 97 criteria, we had six um, major subtype, they described other ones, but they only had one or two cases, for example. What about hypermobility? The first um, evidence, or the, the, I've, I've looked at the literature, and I could see the first documentation um, uh, in the medical uh, literature in 1927. So a while back, when talked about hypermobility of the joint as, as, a, as something hereditary, then you will find quite a lot of information about um, joint laxity, and that is, is causing dislocations. But the first time hypermobility, or what we call generalized hypermobility, came to light as a medical condition was actually in 1967. And that's by a group of rheumatologists from the Hammersmith Hospital in London, where they described a group of patients uh, around 24 patients when they've got generalized flexibility of the joint and they had musculoskeletal symptoms. So at that time, they really concentrated on the musculoskeletal symptoms. They used, um, they used uh, uh, a different um, uh, tool than what we use now. For example, they used, they used to examine 17 different sites and they, they tried to um, grade this according to how flexible the person is or not. So it was the first time they've described it at that point. And as I said, they concentrated on the musculoskeletal aspect with that looking at more of holistically and the whole, and, and, and the whole body. Again, nothing happened for another 10 years or so. Actually, um, you have to count with me, 30 years, between 67 to 1998. Nothing happens significantly till the biting criteria came along, and that was in 1998, and that was published in the year 2000. And I will give you a little bit of insight about the Brighton criteria. Before doing this, um, I really want you to spend some time looking at this slide. I, I was quite emotional when I read it. Um, this has been written in 1967, so we're talking about 50 years ago. Um, I just want to say, this is actually a comment. So their paper is talking about these conditions, or, or this hypermobility syndrome, but at the end of the paper, you will have a discussion between, it was a published discussion between the doctors. And I just want to draw your attention to the fact that at that time, so 50 years ago, we're talking about a patient being misdiagnosed as having rheumatoid arthritis, fibro-osteosis, I think fibromyalgia, and psychoneurosis. And that's 50 years ago. And in my opinion, it's still happening. I get patients on a regular basis when exactly they've been labeled as having all of other things, including neuropsychosis. So hopefully, we will do something to change that. I think lots of you will, or many of you will know that's the, um, about the Brighton criteria. Brighton criteria, it was uh, agreed on in 1998 
but again, some historical aspect. The work for the Brighton Criteria started in 1991. So it took seven years for a group of rheumatologists to agree a revised criteria to say this is what we think is the hypermobility syndrome would be, and it took them two years to publish it. So something like that about criteria, about publication, takes long, long time. And the reason they had that long time, because they couldn't agree on what it would be and also how useful it is going to be in a clinical setting. There's no point of doing a criteria that would be too difficult to apply it and it would become only a research tool. The nice thing about the Brighton criteria, it was the first time that alerted the physicians that you really need to look outside the uh, musculoskeletal symptoms. So if you could see, it wasn't just about pain, we talked about dislocation, but we also talked about something called marfanoid body habitus, the texture of the skin, and maybe some issues with connective tissue, such as varicose veins, hernia, or prolapse. The difficulty with this criteria is it was too inclusive, because according to it, if you are hypermobile and you've got pain, that means you have hypermobility syndrome, and that means you have hypermobility EDS. And according to a, a, a survey, which involved around 1,000 of people, 2 to 3% of the population will be in that category. So that's created quite a lot of problems in terms of research because we were not able to confirm that there is actually a connective tissue problem because all the papers couldn't document that there is a collagen problem and also we couldn't find a gene. So here we are, Alan is coming along trying to summarize that in the 90s, as I said, is there is the EDS3, the benign joint hypermobility syndrome, then we thought, okay, changing slightly the name into hypermobility, EDS, and, and JHS. And then in the late 2000, it was like, you know what? We're not going to fuss over the name. Um, let's say we are dealing with a very similar uh, condition. Let's call them the same and treat them the same. To be honest, that approach worked extremely well in terms of management because we stopped worrying about what it is and we moved on into doing something for it. So now we know much better how to manage it. We know how to, um, that we know, for example, we have to try and, and uh, rehabilitation is essential. Physical activities is essential. Pain management in terms of cognitive behavioral therapy is essential. We know what medication works. We know what the medication you should avoid. So that approach certainly worked in terms of management, but it wasn't great for science. It also created confusion. And the patient were confused because one person will tell them you've got hypermobility syndrome, another person will say, no, no, you've, you've got the hypermobility EDS, and then you, you will say, no, you've got both conditions. It wasn't only the patient that were confused, um, the doctors were very confused to a level that they stopped believing in the whole condition. And again, we've had lots of people telling us oh, you've invented this, or it's the descriptive, uh, you know, it's not, a real, it's not a real problem. And I'm sure lots of you have, um, have experienced something like that. Definitely for research, it wasn't a good idea because we were not able to find or prove that this is a connective tissue. There's an issue, like there is a problem or alteration, let's say, in the collagen. So to try and solve these issues was, okay, um, do we really believe that both conditions are exactly the same? Shall we just say there is hypermobility or hypermobile EDS and nothing else? That was the thinking that starting in 2015 to say, let's start a fresh look. There is nothing has happened for 20 years and it's about time to, to find out. So Alan, um, which in my opinion have put this slide, and I think it is on the website, the HMSA website, to try and explain it really. At the top, you will find um, different cases. Uh, and these cases are the, 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 the type of patient that we would see in a clinic. On the, um, on the far end, you will see a person who is just flexible with no symptoms. So this is according to the doctors. We will call it just hypermobility, and it's a body type. On the other end is a person who is hypermobile, got joint pain, the skin is a different texture, they've got scars, which is thinner than usual, they have subluxations, there is a strong family history, they're not a classic EDS, 
but they certainly not just hypermobile. And in between, you will have a you know a range of patients, sort of sim um, a patient coming with a range of symptoms. So at the top, according to the Brighton criteria, number one will be just uh, hypermobile, but the rest will be under the hypermobility syndrome, EDS hypermobility type, and that's why you could see why two to three percent of the population will be in that category. If we look at the bottom, this is where the 1997 EDS criteria, and according to that, the person, the, the gray color will be the hypermobile, but only the last two perhaps, or last one that will be called as, as EDS. And something in between, I mean, that's where we have to merge things together, otherwise we wouldn't be able to move forward. So it was about time to revise the clinical criteria. It was 20 years since the last one. So how did the work start? Something like this takes long, long time. So the first meeting, um, that happened, um, it was in Ghent, in Belgium, it's 2012, it's the first time I've met um, other people um, across the globe, and it was quite clear that everyone was um, unhappy, that there, is, uh, there hasn't been a movement in terms of uh, science and research. Um, it was a very successful meeting, I think around 300 people from over the world uh, arrived and presented various cases. It became apparent also that we are using different terminology, we're using different diagnostic criteria, and we're using different tools for research. And that's why we couldn't actually interpret each other's results. That was followed a year later to a meeting by geneticist. It was a smaller meeting in Paris. And then it was a move to say that needs to be, uh, something needs to be done. With, um, I have to say, as doctors, we're all very busy. We've got our clinical um, commitment. But we've had a real encouragement I'm not going to say a push. It was encouragement from the patient support group to say, it's been going on for a long period of time. If you're not organized to do it and you don't have the time to do it, we will organize it for you. We'll put the funding, we will put the time, we'll put the effort, but you have to get together and you've got moving. And it was very difficult to say no to this because they've done all the hard work. So EDS UK and EDNF uh, in the States put together an enormous um, money and time to try and get everyone around the world and finally we had the uh, meeting in New York 2016 and it was a very very successful meeting and I think as you know there has been now a creation of a new uh, international uh, uh, patient support group the EDS Society and what's the next is going to be a meeting in Ghent in 2018 to look into the criteria and see if there's anything else needs to be done. So very briefly we had, it's a, it's a huge work, so what, the way it was done that uh, five committees been formed, so one uh, for the classical one, for the cla looking at the classical EDS, uh, one for the hypermobility, vascular and the rarer types, and there was a steering committee. On top of that, there were working groups. There were 10 different working groups, which is the first time ever happened, to look not only about the criteria, to look at the associated symptoms, the management, how can we treat this? So that covers physiotherapy, covers pain, for example, looking at the associated symptoms such as gastroenterology, POTS, for example. And the world, I say, start buzzing. You could imagine with some groups having members in between you know, America and Australia with a 14 hours difference, and these people were communicating. The people communicated through emails, texts, FaceTime, um, any sort of communication just to get the work up and running. So I'll give you some information about, for example, the hypermobility committee, which I was, um, I was very lucky to be and very privileged to be part of it. As you could see, that there has been two doctors, geneticists from the States. So um, Dr. Brad uh, uh, Tinkle and Dr. Howard uh, Levy, for, they are geneticists from the States. From uh, the UK, we've had three rheumatologists, Professor Graham, and Dr. Helen Cohen, consultant rheumatologist, and she looks after the inpatient uh, rehab, pro or she, uh, um, she's involved in patient inpatient rehabilitation, and myself from UCH. Uh, we've had uh, uh, Preta, she is a nurse from Sweden, um, and a patient expert, and also uh, uh, a very talented geneticist uh, from Italy, uh, Marco Story. 
So the way it was done, as I said, is uh, call conferences, um, many emails. The work started really before 2015, but um, 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 really it took a lot, a lot of time and effort. Um, and the same thing happened with the working group, with the other committees. And finally, the, day, the big day came in May 2016. Here you will find, this is the picture of all the people who were involved, around 90 people around the, um, uh, uh, from, uh, from different countries, and this is, um, this is Team GB. And I'm very, very proud to be part of that team. It was very active. We clearly had a lot of information and also experience in dealing with these conditions, with hypermobility in general, with EDS, more of a practical approach. So in terms of management, uh, we had people telling us, we wish we could clone you and get you to different countries, because it wasn't just about describing the conditions, about treating the condition, which was definitely lacking in other parts of the world. Um, as you can see, once again, the, 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 I think the, the power of this meeting, that it wasn't just doctors and physicians, it was the patients and the patient support groups were in the heart of the, heart, in the, heart of the, the whole process. You could see Kay from EDS UK, um, Claire Robb from HMSA, and you could see Lara Bloom, who made, uh, I mean, who put an, an, a phenomenal amount of time and effort and, and, you know, encouraging strongly and pushing at times to try and finish all of the, um, all, all of the work. People, um, the meeting was, was amazing. Um, you could see that people were really glued because we were hungry for information. We couldn't wait to work together. It's been 20 years and nothing has happened. It was very, very useful. It was very intense. Um, but the most difficult one was actually when we came to the hypermobility uh, uh, classification. It was a very intense afternoon. I think it went on for around four or five hours. I can't remember. I mean, the, the meeting was from eight o'clock in the morning till 8.30. At the end, we said, we have to agree because we discussed everything from changing the name, what exactly we need to put in the criteria, what is related to that criteria and what's associated with it. So all of these committees were working together, but the work was put to the whole group. So the decision was done at an international level. And finally, so we've left New York in May 2016 and worked again another year when finally the publication of the uh, papers was um, in, um, in March 2017 in a very prestigious journal, American Journal of Medical Genetics. So according to the 2017 criteria, I do apologize that the, 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 um, uh, the words are quite small, but it's, as I said, the information is all, all available. Now we've got, instead of six major types, which was 20 years ago, to 13 different types. And if you look at all of them, you more or less we know what are these conditions, what's the gene that's involved, what type of collagen is involved. The only problem we still have is that unknown, which is the hypermobility type. And that's why we think with the new diagnostic criteria, there's very good chance in the next five to 10 years that we'll come back and we'll report and there will be something known about this condition. So I'm going to cover three, um, uh, three conditions, the classical one, the vascular, and the hypermobility. And again, my, I feel that I need to give you the inside story rather than the details. So for the classical EDS, the criteria more or less is the same, and that is about flexibility of the joints with scars and hypermobility. The very important change is that one, which is that now we cannot accept this to be a clinical diagnosis because we've got the, uh, we have the te uh, technology to confirm it genetically. And in the past, maybe we got 10 or 20% of people where we think clinically they've got it, they've had a positive testing. I'm very glad to report that now that figure is 90%. So if we've got a clinical diagnosis of classical EDS, we can confirm it in 90% of these patients by doing genetic testing. And if there are areas in the world that they don't have access to genetic testing, a skin biopsy can be done, and then you can see some features that is suggestive of that. Of course, we still have 10% of people where we think they've got it, but that we haven't been able to confirm that does not exclude the criteria. But this is a major 
major uh, uh, um, um, step uh, for the classical EDS. What about the vascular, vascular form of EDS? Again, I just want to, um, I want just to spend some time here because sometimes a patient will mix between vascular symptoms in terms of having tachycardia or POTS or maybe easy bruising and having a vascular EDS. So there are vascular features and there is a vascular EDS which is a very distinct subtype of EDS. The major criteria will involve um, a family member with this condition with a confirmed genetic uh, uh, testing, arterial rupture, so a really significant uh, vascular event like arterial rupture at a young age, um, perforated bowel without knowing a uh, pathology such as, uh, um, like for example, Crohn's or uh, diverticular disease, uterine rupture, um, and also sort of uh, a fistula. There are other minor criteria, and these minor criteria are for the doctors and the specialists to look for, such as easy bruising, a th uh, uh, thin skin, um, uh, there are some facial features. And as I said, sometimes people, when they've been told about EDS, they might look up some of these minor criteria, and they really come panicking to the clinic, thinking, oh my God, I've got, I've got, um, um, I've got this condition. So just... Two pictures only. The one here, as you can see, when we talk about bruises, we're talking about massive, big, spontaneous bruises. This is a, a very nice gentleman with a vascular EDS. When we examine in a clinic, because it's a systemic condition, we literally look at the patient from top to toe. And this gentleman did not realize he had that bruise at the back. He just didn't. So this is the kind of bruising that we see in people with vascular EDS. So please, for anyone who's got smaller bruises in the usual places, do not panic. Definitely discuss it with, a patient, with, with your doctor. Take photographs as well because they might, you might, your appointment might not come when you've got the bruises. But this is the kind of bruises we are talking about when we are suspecting vascular EDS. And also the other one is this one about the... I'm not sure if you could see it with the light, but when we talk about thin skin and, and a translucent skin, as you can see here, you can actually map all the vascular uh, picture in here. I mean, I've, I've got something like that over my chest, but, but it's again, it's the, it's the texture of the skin. And again, this is a minor uh, feature. It's not a major feature. That means, again, please do not panic. By all means, when you see something like that, discuss it with the doctor, but then it's up to the specialist to decide, yes, this is within normality or not. Um, again, the most important thing from the vascular point of view compared to the uh, 1997 criteria that we have to have diagnostic confirmation, and that's by doing genetic testing. So once again, for someone to be labeled as having vascular EDS without genetic testing is not acceptable. Coming to the hypermobility EDS, so um, that was the challenging one because that's the one where we had to really put a lot of effort because we don't have tests to confirm it, not like any other types. So we had to really rely on a set of description and a very strict criteria, hoping this will help researchers in the future and also um, um, uh, help us to find, for example, a gene for it and confirm that this is actually a connective tissue condition. So there are different uh, criteria, there are three uh, criteria, and to make these diagnoses, you have to have all of them, one, two, and three. The first one is we need documentation of a generalized joint hypermobility. I'm pleased to report that we're still using the Byton criteria because it is very reliable, it's very quick, it's easy to apply, and it wouldn't be too much for rheumatologists or for GPs to apply it in a clinic setting. There's no point of putting another uh, type of a test that will take a long time because no one will apply it. So for the generalized hypermobility, um, we, for adults it will be more than five. For the people who are above the age of 50, which I call when they're wiser, uh, so when we're wiser we can accept more than four. Historical, ED, uh, historical hypermobility does, we, date, we do take that into consideration, so if you've got the five-point questionnaires, and I'm very happy to take questions about that if someone doesn't know what, we, what, what is it exactly, we can add a point. 
the one which is very, very important and significant that there is something for children and adolescents in this uh, criteria, and that is to say that they need a high probability above six. And by doing this, we're hoping that the pediatricians will come on board. So the first one, you need to have a confirmation there's generalized high probability. The second one, this is a little bit complex, but basically you've got three features. And of these three features, you have to have two at least. So the feature which is very common or like very uh, logical is to have musculoskeletal complications in terms of pain or instability. The second one is positive family history, but it has to be the 2017 criteria. So this would work for the future not for the past. So if there is a family history of EDS, hypermobility according to 1997 criteria, they wouldn't be, they would, it wouldn't be taken into consideration here. The one which is very important, and it was again a, a major step, is these systemic manifestations. There are a list of 12 different things, and it was decided that if you have five of them, you will be in the category of the hypermobile EDS. For example, the skin has to be quite soft, stretchier than normal. You will have extensive stretch marks without weight gain. Uh, for example, a pelvic, pro, uh, pelvic floor prolapse without, um, without pregnancies, uh, 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 recurrent abdominal hernias, lots of, symptom, sort of symptoms and signs that will tell us that there is, the connective tissue has been altered because that's the only way of getting everyone to agree that there's something else is going on um, in these group of patients. So for example, it's just the pictures, um, you know, recurrent abdominal hernias, prolapse, um, there's something called pathogenic papules. This is very common in a normal population, but anyway, it's a minor feature and if it, if it occurs with other things, we, we, it can be taken into consideration. We're talking about marfanoid body habitus and also abnormalities on the echocardiogram. The third thing, which is very important, and this is again the first time to be included, is we have to make sure that these patients do not have other conditions such as neuropathy, myopathy. We've got quite a few patients where they're coming along with extreme flexibility of the joint, but the problem is not the joint themselves, it's actually the muscles or the nerves, so we have to make sure that they don't have an underlying cause, medical cause, to cause the problems with the joints. So coming back to the lovely uh, slide from Dr. Hakim, as we, we discussed initially, the top one is what we would consider in uh, uh, the hypermobility syndrome according to the Brighton criteria. The bottom will be the EDS 1997 criteria. And here we are. The question was, we all felt we can't have all or nothing. We can't just have hypermobile EDS and everyone else is nothing because clearly there are people who are hypermobile, they've got issues and there is pain and they have some vaginal features but not to the level where you say this is the hypermobile EDS. So that's where the new terminology which is the hypermobility spectrum disorder came to light. And I want here to say again, it's the, the the hypermobile EDS or hypermobility spectrum disorder doesn't mean one is more severe than the other, one is more significant than the other. It, it, it's, it, it's just a different, it's just something different. So we do have people who have sometimes even the hypermobility, you don't correlate with the level of, of symptoms. So that's very important for anyone in the room to know that it is, it, it, it's not one is more severe, because sometimes when you say this is hypermobility spectrum disorder, as if he's not taking things seriously, or maybe you're not going to have the medical attention you need, and that's not the case. The management plan is exactly the same. The other things which I read to reassure people, that's we're not undiagnosing people according to 1997 criteria. The idea, this is a, a work for the future. So if someone is already being diagnosed, yes, that's perfectly fine. We respect that. You will continue to be a hypermobile EDS according to 1997 criteria, but wouldn't be in the research project that will be for the future. That's the only difference. So to combine things together, when one slide, in the early 2000s, we talk about EDS-3, joint hypermobility syndrome, then they merged, and now for, they merged for a good reason, for management plan, and it worked, and we know how it works, but created a problem in terms of research, and now we're looking at two different conditions, the hypermobile EDS, and then the hypermobility spectrum disorder. 
So the hypermobility spectrum disorder is basically more or less uh, people with hypermobility, pain, instability, other features, but they just do not fulfill all the criteria that we discussed, which is a quite a tight one, and we will be looking at that next year in 2018. Again, apologize, the, the, the pictures are small, but you can have access to these papers. And um, we, we describe now the hypermobility, we're looking at it as more of a generalized one, where the the, the um, Biton score is more than five, or it could be peripheral, which is only hands and feet, which we see it mainly in children, for example, or you can say it's sort of more localized when it is less than five, the, the Biton score. And again, that will be more of a research tools and looking at outcomes. Um, you might have seen that. I can't get that clearer than this. This is the, this is, this is the uh, uh, EDS checklist. This is what we use in the clinic and is being used in not just in the UK and across the, the world. And I'm making, well, we're all making sure that we're sharing this with everyone who's looking after people with hypermobility. So basically, it's just to summarize what is the criteria. Um, the, the, as you can see, there are three sections. And at the bottom, it will say, will this person be classified as hypermobile EDS or will it be the hypermobility spectrum disorder? And something like that will be used uh, for register in the future and also for research. So if you look at some of the papers that we've, uh, is, being, uh, is being published, I just want to say that at the end, I've got five minutes. So um, it, it just to say that the the, the the papers, as I said, it's the the Brighton score was uh, sorry. The Brighton criteria was too inclusive. Too many people were in the same category, and the uh, the classification was here to clarify who would we call hypermobile EDS for future research. And again. Um, Alan and Mark Castori have recently published an amazing paper to try to clarify the thoughts behind the uh, hypermobility spectrum disorder. Um, and that's really is recognizing that this is, we're describing the symptoms rather than um, giving a specific diagnostic criteria. There's no doubt um, the feedback, certainly from the specialists and for the doctors around the world, from even the most, uh, you know, the people, the non-believers, as we, we, we call them, they've been very, very positive. We've had uh, a very useful meeting with one of the uh, top pediatric rheumatologists last week. And after an hour and a half, hour and a half of discussion, uh, he said, you want me. And it was, a, I mean, I was almost like in tears. It's like, finally, they're going to listen to this. I just want to say that um, both conditions are associated with other symptoms, such as pain, fatigue, uh, postural, like uh, POTS, uh, autonomic dysfunction, you have uh, gastrointestinal dysfunction. So again, one of the, the, the problems that happened in the past, if you're in the EDS, you'll have this. If you don't have it, that means you're not an EDS. That's not the case. Both conditions, um, you will have these systemic manifestations. Oh, because you could tell this was Alan's uh, slide. <laughs> okay, so, um, so if we want to think about there are two disorders, but there are multiple symptoms, and there was a question is why we didn't include some of these features in the diagnostic criteria, because so far we don't know if there is, it's part of the condition itself or it's an association, but it's definitely a work in progress. So what's the future? Certainly at international level, uh, this has not stopped. We are sharing this new criteria with all specialists around the world. We're gathering feedback about, is it workable? Is it something that could be used in the clinic? Could the GP use it? And also, we are going to establish an EDS registry and use that for research. And of course, we're all very excited about having the next meeting in Ghent 2018 about the UK, and again, I'm going to be very, very uh, uh, brief. Uh, a lot of work with two, the, the two charities put together. They are involved, and they are in the heart, not just involved, they are in the heart of this uh, new diagnostic criteria. They certainly were present uh, in New York, and they will have patient representation. They, uh, both of them are working with the consortium for the future. Um, and I think, um, uh, I think you will have, I'm hoping that in the next two to three years, we'll come back and tell you about the results of the GEN 2018. Thank you very much for your attention.